And we are recording. Cool. So, hey, everyone. Sorry for being late and I have to close the door. <laughs> um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, my, my video setting is not working proper anymore after a stupid Windows update, typical issue here. Um, so, uh, what uh, I have to do a little bit of improvisation and let's see how we can figure that out uh, in some terms. But um, most of the stuff uh, can be shown, and I've tried to um, show it to you in a different way than what is happening there. Um, so, maybe what I can do is um, I will try in the meantime then uh, setting up some stuff while showing it. So, first of all, um, welcome to the party. I bought some Red Bulls <laughs> because we're doing party. Mm -hmm. um, what we're going to do today is um, we will talk about any uh, nice tools and helpers that can make our life easier when it comes to programming or even in advance to program. Um, the first thing to start with um, is uh, I'm going to talk about Reaper. And therefore, we switch here. So, uh, with Reaper, uh, we got a little nice audio editing suite, uh, which is uh, free to use. Um, you can register it and buy it for a little money, but still, um, you can use it for a very, very long time uh, for free. And I think it's worth the whatever, $69 or something like that. Um, Reaper is not just useful when it comes to create audio or edit audio tracks or few audio tracks together with video. Reaper can do a lot of things directly for us when we program a show. So, um, as you can see here, um, I made a little track inside here. Track number one would be then my audio track. I've already prepared um, two tracks here which is uh, track number two and three. These are just time code generators. We will talk a bit about that in a little bit. Um, what we have here then is, um, on what, what is very nice about Reaper is um, that Reaper has um, so-called markers, which we can set up here. And these markers, you can set very easy. If the application is running, you just hit the M key and then uh, these markers are done. So, um, and these markers can be shown then later on here in the view. And the view, you go to um, Region and Marker Manager. And I'll open on my wrong screen, sorry. Let me get that one to you. And it's too big. There we go. And so we have then these region markers. Um, these region markers, as you see, as I uh, edit some of them, they are now sorted now by uh, how they've been created. And um, I can, if I do a um, right click inside here, and I can uh, renumber them in timeline order so that everything is directly in the timeline order. The way it should be, then my numbers, my markers are here exactly in the same naming and the same order. And I can put in names here. So maybe start, let's start with start, that's a guitar. And that could be my chorus one. And so on and so on. So, and with all these things that uh, doing here, um, this is quite nice because if I have an audio track up in here, uh, it shows me uh, the waveform and I then can edit those cues very, very exact by dragging and dropping them exactly where I want them. Uh, so if I have a special hit somewhere, I can directly put that marker there. So once done with those, um, what I can do then is um, I can go again here um, and go export regional markers. So with that export act option for region markers, um, the console um, creates a file. I name it just high end systems tutorial. It's always named by the name of the repo file. Um, it directly creates a CSV file. And I just save that to my desktop. 
And then they, from my desktop, which is now totally safe on the other side, probably. Doesn't open up another window. From here, uh, from my desktop. And they have the region markers file, which I then can drag and drop to a thumb drive. Plug that in. So there's my USB thumb drive. I just take that CSV file, copy it over there on my iPhone, and I then have it here somewhere, high in systems, whatever, uh, markers CSV. And then I can take that little file and take that one to my console. So uh, oops, here we go. Um, we're doing that all live here, so nothing free reported. So, and then let's walk to the camera here. So, and then when we go to the um, our list window. Which we have here. Can you see that? So we have our QList window here. And in our QList window, is it good? Exposure one? Yeah, it's okay. And here, I just go to import QList. So I go to an empty cell, go to import QList, go to my USB disk. And there I find my high assistance tutorial regions marker. I select that file, um, operations completed, and it directly gave me here this new list where you can see it's important. You can switch to microphones audio wise. So maybe it's yeah, like that, because I'm now standing next to the other camera, which has also a microphone. So this gives me now this empty queue list. So um when I go to another page, right here, and I say list 15 move down there. List 15 move here. So, what we can get there then, so take just the camera off to show it. So, we then get here now this list 15, and this list 15. Is exactly what I did before. So, as you can see, it has taken all the timings um, which I put in. Uh, hello, screen. Yep. It has taken all the timings which we have inside there. Um, it has taken all the namings and so on and so on. So, this is a very, very fast and easy way. Um, to create my time-coded queue lists, so without the need to do uh, any special uh, learn function or whatever. So I can put in my queues very, very accurate. I can already give them names. And so I have now my fully structured queue list, and I just only need to fill that queue list uh, with information. Um, what else can we do to create those queue lists or to create queue lists in, the, in that way? is um, another thing is we can go um, via, unfortunately, only for the um, Windows users, is something, uh, let's go here again. Um, oops. So, um, what we can here see then um, is we can have uh, Excel. So I repeat that. What if, um, for Excel we need um, the first thing we need to do is go to in the main menu. Um, there's one thing here down there in the options, and this is only available in Windows, unfortunately. In these options, you find uh, under uh, advanced settings, and by the way, it's called Germany. You find, um, oh no, it's 
you need to you need to edit your uh, manual and you need to enable the developer tools in Germany for German users it's called entwickler tools um, and you need to enable those and once done uh, you find up here in your uh, developer tools you will find uh, some options for XML editing or this whole new tab called developer tools and in those developer tools we have those XML file editing stuff available um, what I already preferred, and uh, I think we can share. I can share that file later on. We can upload that together with the recording. Um, is um, I just or how I created that file? I, I just took a normal queue list I did in um, in the uh, in the hawk and export and uh, took that. I uh, took that, uh, exported that as an XML file, and then I imported that here into Excel. And with that, I get the whole uh, XML structure, which you can find if you click here on the XML source or credit in German. And then you see, you see the whole structure of the XML data displayed. So, for example, for Hawk, when it show, it's the cutis, it's a number, it's a name, and the queue itself has number, name, comment, trigger, uh, milliseconds in a time. Um, and with that data, um, you can then, um, by drag and dropping these data elements um, into a column here, you can create this um, XML layout for your spreadsheet. So, um, while we've seen the, um, when we when we look into Reaper again, Reaper only has these full numbers and it totally does its numbering on a, a normal structure, lowest at the beginning, highest and top, and then you sort it by that. But this version or this option when you do stuff like that with uh, Excel um, is that you can already, if you have like a book which is already predefined and written where you have special queue numbers and so on, you can do that um, directly there um, without the need to redo all your queue numberings. So what in, this is a real example, what I had here. This is uh, the first queue list for, uh, for a show in Switzerland where I, need to prepare, where I had to prepare that stuff. So we had here given all these queue numbers already. Um, also special given names, and I could also use the column uh, for the comments. And in the trigger, there we see now the different trigger options. So in the trigger options, we have a hall, which is this normal um, queue like we know it, when we press go and go and go and go. We can enter a weight. This will then uh, give me directly uh, a wait time for that queue. We enter that wait time in milliseconds. Uh, we could also do like a follow. Um, and we also could do like time coded queues. Um, there we go. So when you do the time code uh, over here, um, you see here how you have to enter the timing, so it's hours, um, minutes, seconds, and then a dot for the frames. So, um, like the way you are used when you enter uh, timings again. You also can do like follow, follow plus time, stuff like that, so that's very easy. Um, and so you can easily use your own uh, Excel sheets and create cubes out of those Excel sheets directly without the need. Um, to do or redo these whole things. Um, because very often we have already a director who has done that work and already prepared that stuff. So um, it's not necessary a must that you need to do, redo that. Uh, once done, when you all have done that, um, you just go to export. Um, export that XML data, just ask me where I want to store it. Uh, Give me a name, so I make that my test list. Uh, ah, I forgot one thing. What I put also inside there is when you go up here, what is nice about that, I can um, give that list a, uh, a queue list number and uh, a name. So um, whenever I'm importing lists like that, I can directly say, OK, this should be list number 25. It should be the test list. Um, so I export that one um, to my desktop. 
and I say, oh, um, this is my EXO uh, tutorial, whatever. Export that one. And here it is. So I just need to bring back my subtrack and put that in. Now I want to connect it to my windows. Yeah, there are more words on that. <laughs> And I have my some drive here, and I have my exit tutorial file here, just let it love it. And then it should be there. Exit tutorial, yeah. And there we go. And we go to here again. So same game, um, we go to uh, our QList window, we go to import QList, we go to our uh, USB, we have our Excel tutorial here. I select that XML file. As you see, it was an XML file now, so CSV and XML are both supported. Um, and my test list is here, so I take my test 25 and move it down there. Oops, it's 25 move here. So, and then let's take it away. And there we go. We have our test list directly there with all the information um, I have already entered before. So, um, very nice and easy way to create queue lists um, and uh, to have all your information ready when you need them without to redo all the work somebody else has already done. There's another option. Um, there's another software which is called Inkscribe, uh, which I don't have a demo here at the moment. Um, but with Inkscribe, you can do basically all the same. Um, Inkscribe, Inkscribe also um, provides the option to export as a CSV or XML, I can't remember exactly. And these Inkscribe files can also be directly um, be taken to the console, and the console can directly read it. And it creates a QList in the same way like we did right now with uh, Excel or Reaper. So um, that was a little bit like um, how to use um, or how to create QList with Excel and Reaper and to prepare stuff. Um, so um, let's go back to Reaper. Uh, when we go back to Reaper here, let's get rid of that. Um, and this is where now, um, oh wait, let's do it different. I skip Reaper to the end and because then I need to recable some stuff here. And uh, I first uh, go on with the MIDI side a little bit, which is also very nice and easy to show. Um, MIDI, let's get rid of Reaper as well. Uh, for MIDI, I have here uh, a nice setup. Let's switch to the camera so we can see that one. Take it in my hand, it's doing better. All righty. So here we are. So um, what I'm using here um, to show all the MIDI stuff here is I have just a normal PreSonus uh, audio interface, um, which is very nice because it also has MIDI in and out. 
Um, I'm using a Rosendahl MIG4, which is a time code reader and generator and converter. Um, to show some little nice stuff, I have a Novation Launchpad, um, and all that is connected um, via USB and MIDI um, to my laptop, and then back there to the hook. Um, to the hook in the hook in the configuration for the hook. Um, let me go to the network window right there. I only use one MIDI input. I only use the internal MIDI uh, configuration, uh, the internal MIDI um, device for uh, LTC and MIDI. Um, so this is uh, MIDI channel. This is stuff not assigned yet, but also for MIDI time code, um, I use the same um hardware so there's no routings done there so this is all what i show right now is all done um via the software here uh what is very nice uh the software is called mini pipe um it's a shareware and with that software we can you can do very very crazy media routines and all kind of stuff so that's one thing you should really have on your computer if you work with midi and what also I recommend all the time is that you have like a MIDI viewer here. Um, this is just a, also a shareware MIDI monitor, which shows all kind of MIDI stuff. Um, why is that not working? Uh, so, um, about MIDI. Um, what, where can MIDI help us? Um, MIDI can help us in a lot of ways when we want to expand and, um, yeah, because our, or even get triggers from someone else or expand our hardware also. Because sometimes we're running out of buttons, we're running out of uh, faders and stuff like that. And, with, and then it comes at that point where MIDI um, gets very handy. Another point where you can use MIDI is when it comes to time code stuff or automation. Because uh, MIDI, with MIDI, we can trigger events. Um, MIDI also uh, can provide time code. And this is then very, very useful in terms of automation or if you want, if we want to trigger someone else. So because MIDI is like a bit universal language with video equipment talks, uh, audio equipment talks, also MIDI. And so we can have a lot of uh, other stuff uh, trigger our console or let our console trigger MIDI. And this is then where stuff like the, uh, Subtle MIDI, uh, the subtle soft MIDI pipe gets handy because, um, as we know, at the moment still, I'm actually saying at the moment because uh, the whole MIDI stuff is newer, um, uh, all our keys are hard mapped. So each button or hardware button or hardware fader on the console has a dedicated value which you can find in the manual. So if you need to have special triggers or special buttons triggers, um, there's a way you can do it via those comment macros in the MIDI node input. So you can define, okay, I'm sending that MIDI node input, and then you define the comment macro. Uh, show that in a second. Just need to prepare that camera again. So um, that's one option. And the other option is if you don't want to do all that stuff and want to have like, if you have a predefined set already on your console which you, which you want to reuse, uh, you can then reuse, you can use then stuff like uh, this little software. Um, and I want to show um, how that works, uh, or this is done in an example uh, here with the uh, innovation launchpad. Um, so, just if you see the launchpad, it's not small and not big one. No, it's not really working. Mm. 
disease, forces of disease. There we go. All right. So what I did here is um, I'm sending some uh, media data uh, from and to uh, the Novation Launchpad. And I just need to adjust the camera to the launch pad so you can see later on what's going on. Alrighty. So, um, actually, I did just here with the media routing for the launch pad. Um, I did a MIDI input. Uh, I did several stuff here, which you can see under pipes. These are all the stuff which you, which I prepare. Um, so um, the the MIDI pipe is actually just a translation program. So you can send in any data, filter data, send it out or whatever. So um, it also gives you almost unlimited usage of uh, MIDI data controlling. And this is very, very nice. And I will show you uh, here on an example for the innovation launch pack and also then also later on for the before. So um, what I did here is um, I did a launch pack color pipe. Um, this media input just selects my audio box USB input, um, which is connected by USB to my laptop. And it gets MIDI from the console, from MIDI out from the console into the MIDI in uh, of that audio box. And so I can read those informations here. And then um, I created a message factory. Uh, this message factory listens to uh, a MIDI note that's C0, that's note number one or zero, depending on how you count it. If you count from zero to 127 or one, to 128 because that's the, how many MIDI uh, nodes we have because MIDI is just seven bit. Uh, so that's my trigger uh, on any velocity. Um, and the message I created here is a nine bit uh, sysx message. So don't worry about that. This is stuff you can then find in the launchpad information or what you need to know when you want to trigger stuff. Um, but I, what I want to show you how you can easily create um, just from a node output, which you, where we have a very, very nice and easy workflow to do in the console, uh, how we can create that um, uh, that trigger here for, and that trigger actually calls a sysx um, command, which lights up all those buttons on the on the, on the launch pad. So what I did is. Um, I need more cameras <laughs> next time. So um, what I did is um, where I switch the camera. Here we go. Um, so when we go into our um, media notes windows, can you see the light? It's too bright, I guess. So, um, what you can see here on that MIDI notes window, yeah. um, I said, okay, I put my init launchpad um, on node zero, channel one, it should be on, and it should be a velocity of uh, one, which is fine, which means a node on. Um, and I created this MIDI node macro. So uh, with this media node macro, second a second, take the camera in my hand, it makes life easier for me. So I put that one into just a queue list here. I have two uh, queues inside here. Um, and this is just empty queues here with nothing inside. It's just triggering that stuff here. 
So I'm sending out actually when I triggered that cue list, uh, I can see it together. Let's see. Yeah, they see. Let's take that away. They can see the launch pad. And when I trigger that queue here, here we go. Yay, all green. So um, with that queue, I can then uh, run that command, this very long SysX command from the, um, uh, from my, uh, with a single node, which I can easily understand. So if there's someone who can help me out, um, who knows a little bit more in, in media and so on, he can do, he or she can do that stuff for me. Um, with that going on, I can then also create a um, queue list, which is, or a queue, which just lights up then, as you can see here, one row in um, white and one button in blue. Um, each of those, each of these buttons on the Novation Launchpad uh, can be controlled by a MIDI node. Um, so um, we can define for each of those 64 buttons a normal MIDI node out there in our MIDI node window here. So if you open, open, so I could define here like 64 buttons and uh, trick with a um, trigger each of these buttons. You will find all the information which node it is uh, in the manual of innovation launchpad. And then with the velocity, you define the color of these buttons. So we can, if you want to create, for example, a, a scene trigger layout or something like that, um, it's very, very easy doable uh, with that. So um, if you have an eight by eight grid done in your scenes, um, just uh, send out that specific media note um, with the uh, color which you want for that button. And uh, Whenever you trigger that scene, this button will change its color and that the lights go on initially so that they don't have to press any all buttons before. You could define um, something like that with the SysX commands in the uh, MIDI pipe. Um, in all the versions of FOC, I have to uh, admit it was directly doable from the console. They could send out. Um, these SysX commands directly as a MIDI comment macro, but this got broken, unfortunately, and is still buggy uh, in the newer version. This got broken when we get introduced uh, the eight MIDI devices, unfortunately, but the bug is locked and um, it should be fixed in one of the next versions, uh, hopefully, so that we don't need to do all this stuff with MIDI pipe. So we can directly trigger those colors and everything, those SysX commands directly from uh, the console again. Which leads me uh, to the next thing, which we can trigger uh, directly from the console, which is also often important. And this is um, the before. So I did exactly the same thing. So with the myth, uh, as you can see here on the launch pad, I said, a pipe up with four set time one. And again, it's just a special uh, note where this trigger comes in. Um, and then I sent the media out again from uh, this media output here. Then this media out goes um, to the console and from the media out of the console, uh, from the media out of the console from the through, it goes here into that with four. So, that all these devices get the same MIDI data. Um, Why well, I can use that right now? Because, like I said, um, the MIF4 is not just a, a time code interface which can translate LTC into MTC or vice versa, uh, which can, by the way, also be used directly as an LTC input on any Rotor or Hedgehog which doesn't have um, LTC inputs. So you can connect the MIF4 as an LTC or as a MIDI input, and then um, the uh, via USB, the console then recognizes the MIF4 as a generic MIDI device. And uh, when you send in the LTC, uh, the console takes that LTC and uh, con uh, the MIF4 takes that LTC, converts it into MIDI, and then the console can read that time code as a MIDI time code also a very uh, nice and um, cool usage of the before when you want to input a uh, time code into your console. 
Uh, what were, what back to the trigger stuff? What we had uh, with triggering um, these stuff there. Um, you do it exactly the same way when we go back to our my MIDI pipe. I just created that message factory here inside that message. This is the whole thing. And um, I can show you that message here again when it's triggered. And we, so I go here to the console. Uh, switch the camera. So on the camera here, I have a cue list done, which says two time codes. Here we go. So these are just. Um, Macros I created in my MIDI node macro. Um, these MIDI nodes again then trigger uh, the MIDI pipe. And when I trigger, let's see if you can see that here. So now, as you can see, the clicking. Uh, what can we do again? again? No. But you might hear the clicking of my finger, and you see. I push the button extra hard, and I can. And you see, I said now the um, the uh, the before to be uh, the time port reader or as a, as my MIDI reader, and uh, it reads directly these informations and sets its time. Uh, the same thing applies then for um, setting the the generator on and off. So you can use your console that also as in like a show control system where you want to uh, where you can then enter uh, time code values directly from your console, send them from your console, um, trigger them, and uh, be the master of the whole whole system if you don't have any other. Um, stuff running there, which can create time code. So that was the before. So let me look at my cheat sheet. Um, uh, it's MIDI nodes in an output. With MIDI nodes input, um, because that's also a question quite often asked. Um, is uh, how we can trigger stuff via MIDI. Um, I guess we all did that before. You just go in the console into the settings, and then you have the MIDI node input, and then you can assign per channel uh, what each channel should do. You can assign the different types of keys there. You can assign playback bars. Um, hey, Mark, switch your input. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. So I go back. Too much to do for one person. I need an assistant. So um, when you want to do um, MIDI node triggering, because all I did here at the moment was like MIDI node output um, or trigger stuff from the console, but also we want to trigger our console. And to trigger our console, this also can be done in several ways. One way is again via MIDI. You go just there in the console settings, go to settings, then you go to the MIDI node input, and there you assign what you want to have triggered by uh, MIDI. So what most or a lot of people do is use tend to use comment macros because then in comment macros here's a little setup. So you have all the 128 MIDI nodes here, and with these MIDI nodes you can just enter the macro what you want to do. So you can trigger a scene. Um, like with a GS for go scene one or whatever, just press set and you get the whole scene um, trigger macros you already know. And you also get again the uh, for sure the uh, your custom created MIDI node uh, out triggers. So you can trigger something from that pad, which then actually activates something else. So that's also a very nice way uh, for mapping and doing stuff. Um, you can recall a few or whatever you want to add. Uh, you know, there are, the sky is the limit, or your imagination. Um, yeah, which then leads me to a more um, elegant way or also bi directional way of uh, doing things, and that's, uh, that's OSC. Um, OSC is also or it's getting more and more popular, more and more common uh, during the last years. Um, 
not just because it gives you way more options than me. It's also it's a bi an easier bi bi-directional uh, protocol. It's very very much faster. It works uh, via network. Um, so you can you can distribute it uh, over long distance. While MIDI is limited to three to five meters, there are also options to transport MIDI um, via uh, RTP MIDI, so via network, which is directly inbuilt into um, Apple, for example, or with Kiss boxes or something like that. But in general, MIDI is just set to work with lengths up to five meters. So. Um, OSC is also quite often asked um, how OSC is um, set up and how it can be done and uh, how do I need to set up my um, my router or my Wi-Fi station or whatever. Um, and that's what I want to show you right now. So uh, in my case here, um, I took a very, very old uh, Airport Express space station, which I had left over. And um, with the uh, configuration program, I always tend to use stuff like that in a, in a manual configuration. Um, same with when I uh, configure my networking and all that stuff. Um, I prefer to have everything done uh, with manual IP addresses because I know exactly which device is missing or not working or whatever. Um, so for the hotnet here, um, I went into the settings for the hotnet and I said that uh, Gates Airport Express a name and I set it to a manual IP address, which is uh, 172.31.31.32. Um, as you know, typical hotnet IP address. Um, Why is not showing the the next, the next chart. Hello, no, it's still showing. Ah, it drives me nuts. <laughs> oh, no, it's doing it. All right. So, um, in the settings for the airport, uh, you just go to the Internet tab and you go uh, for the Internet connection, you go to Ethernet and in the uh, in the mode how you want to use that um, station, it's important to set the um, airport to go to bridge mode so um, that it's just bridging the network, that it doesn't do any uh, NAT, so network address translations or, or not also not any DHCP stuff, also not in any IP addresses. Um, that's also important. Um, like said, in the TC TCP IP settings, you go to the manual setting, and then you go to this IP address, which I've given, uh, use the same subnet mask. Um, the router address I'm using always is the same address of my console here, say for the, the main name server. And yeah, last but not least, giving a, give it a network, uh, um, some security, making a, a passcode on it, and there you go. So this is important. And also important is to remember that you remember the IP address of your uh, Wi-Fi station, of your, uh, uh, no matter if it's just an access point or a router. Um, this is important to remember because we need that in the next step when it comes to configure our iPad or whatever mobile device we're using. Um, in that case, I will use my iPad and I switch the inputs now here for my iPad. Hey, Mark, before yeah. we get too much into OSC, um, yeah. Paul was asking in the Q&A, is there a way to get other colors on output from HOG? I guess like kind of like color mixing RGB, or is it just strictly whatever the velocity get gives what you get on the launch pad? On the launch pad, on the launch pad you have um, on the launch pad you have like predefined 127 T colors which you can use. So each node in the manual there's a wait I have the manual here give me a second I can show it to you how it's defined. Um, 
And those are defined by the velocity, right, on the note? Yes, on the velocity. Yes, you, you, send, uh, you send the same MIDI note out with a velocity, um, like the like the button has, right? Um, I have it here. It's a good, and I'll show it to you. So, Sorry, um, I didn't want to leave many notes too too far yeah, behind whenever I asked this. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's fine. So as you see, these are the colors which you can do. Um, we are, these are defined uh, the colors. Uh, zero turns it off, and then it goes like from white, little white, gray, grayish to all different colors. So these are the colors that are available, and um, each of these buttons. Uh, uh, Let's see if we can make that over here. And so you can see it. So this is the um, each of these button on the launch pad. That's a 51 hex uh, code, and that's a dec the decimal code. And there you find the the note itself. Um, but in the, in the hop, we need to have this number. So it's 81. So you need to send out a note 81, and that's actually what I did so when you, which, or in that case, 11, I can show it to make that blue. Um, I just, you just send out the note 11 um, in that specific uh, value. And when I go here, I can show it to you. Um, wait. Go back to notes. So let's switch that camera. As you can see here, that's my note 11. Yeah? And I have my velocity 45, and that gives me that blue. If I change that velocity bar to something else, if I change that to whatever 67, and trigger that uh, yeah. Okay, you see, it find, defines to another color. So these are with the color here and that combination done together. You get the um, get the. Uh, you can define the color of the button. So when you have a look here again, so this is the this is the button number, uh, so so the note number in a decimal way. So it goes from eleven to eighty to nineteen from the bottom row. So very easy to remember. It starts with eleven, and the top one is uh, starts with the eighties and goes to eighty nine. Uh, the very top row is done especially. These are with control changes. Um, so, and, uh, yeah, with that, you again can say, uh, as it comes down a little bit more, top left grid. And then it's just select the note and with the velocity, um, so 81 with a velocity of 45 gives you then that blue because 45, if you look here, uh, somewhere in there, this blue. So there's no directly RGB control uh, in that way. You can uh, you can do directly RGB control when you use the SysX command, which I have been talking about before. But if you want to go the easy route with just the nodes on and off, uh, then it's the best way to use the predefined uh, colors. I hope this was the answer to that question. Yeah, I think that what from what I understand, I think that was the answer to your to Paul's question here. Okay, cool, great. So um, then I uh, continue with the OSC setups. Um, so, uh, like I said, um, it's important to remember the, your IP address uh, here that you um, because we need to use that IP address later on. Uh, when setting up your mobile device. Uh, and now I switch to my mobile device, but my switcher only has four inputs, so I need to manually take one away. So here we go. 
So first, um, I'm just using my regular iPad here in that case. Um, for the iPad, you just go to your settings. Um, connect to your Wi-Fi. As you can see, I use uh, my HopNet here. And in the HopNet, um, you have to do some manual adjustments. Um, I configured the IP address to be 172.31.04. Uh, uh, That's my IP address for my iPad. The same uh, subnet mask 255.255.00. And now it comes, uh, my, this is what often people forget to do, um, to put in here a router address. So uh, the router address is um, my Wi-Fi access point. And um, this would already work, but there's little things to do when you want to have, be sure that also the Wi-Fi well, wi sign pops up in where now they are playing on the server. Um, you can go into your domain name server configuration, go also into manual, um, go to plus, and then enter again, 172, 31, 31, 32. Um, so that's the DNS server for my, um, for my request, and then you also see the Wi-Fi popping up up there. This is something it would work before as well, but uh, you're not quite sure if you connect it or not. Um, this has something to do with the settings Apple requires to um, to show you that you have a fully working uh, internet connection. If it is that you need a router address set and they also need the domain name service set. And you can use both times the IP address of your access point. So that's basically the first steps you need to do in configuration of your iPad. Um, Console-wise, um, we also need to go and trigger some stuff. So let's go back to my handy cam here. So in the console, we go again in our network window, um, go again to the console tab, and go to my settings here, and we go to open sound control. Right. Right. Try to make it better. I guess that's better. Yes. Um. So here, uh. You need to configure two sub two things. First of all, you need to configure um, a port for uh, incoming data and outgoing uh, OSC data, which is quite important. Um, here you see again the IP address of your console, and and here you see the IP address of the device where you want to send that data to. And as you see, I'm using the four, which is the IP address of my iPad. Uh, I'm using UTP, which is fine, just leave it like this. And which is important that these two ports are uh, not matching. So you need to enter different ports here for, uh, for the console um, in and output port. So 7001, 7002 is what I have chosen here. Um, yeah, so this is what you need to do console wise. And then back to my iPad. Um, I'm using, there are several ways of uh, what you can use. Um, there are several remotes available. Uh, unfortunately, I have to, uh, on that iPad, I don't have the one Meg and it. I can show it to you later on. There's also an OC um, device uh, because I'm using, still using OS 12 and it's an old one. Um, iOS 12 and Megan's app needs iOS 13. Um, so I use it with this general one with this Touch OSC. So Touch OSC is a software from Hexler. You can download it for about like three to five dollars, euros, whatever, not too expensive. Um, and there are templates already available um, for these uh, Touch OSC connect uh, software. Um, very easy then to transfer those layouts um, from your computer 
um, to your mobile device. You just need to have it connected in the same network, um, start a sync process in the both softwares, and then you can sync it. Um, in the connections here of Touch OSC, you need to go to the settings of the OSC, enable it, and for the host, um, you need to enter the IP address of the console. So that was my 172.31.01. And for my outgoing port, this is uh, is by 7001, which is on my console. When we look here again, my in port. Yeah. So in and output on the console must uh, be swapped on the iPad or the mobile device, so that you can have, which is quite sure, like me, if you send something to MIDI out, you put it to MIDI in port on the receiving device. So the same thing applies for OSC. So uh, this is what I set up here. Outgoing is 7001. Incoming is 7002. My local IP address, as we did that before, is done as 172.3.104. Um, so all my setting match, uh, my host match. And when I go back and go to done here, you see directly uh, this nice layout. And as you can see, my button is flashing down here. And this is also the same applies for that button here on my iPad. I can put that next to each other. Let's see. So here we go. As you can see, um, the state of the console and so on is all the same. When I'm now uh, moving that fader here, the fader of the console moves as well. So here we go. Direct feedback here. Um, when I'm flashing that button, I have something on it. Here we go. Here I have a flash button. I have feedback on all of that. And I have, can use that as another device to control my console. You can select stuff. Uh, same thing in the programming section. When I type something here in my command line, So, so, oops. Too much stuff happened at the same time. <laughs> so, you see the feedback directly also comes up here. What is in the um, in the command line um, also is shown in the touch OSC. Same applies then for. Um, for the command keys, um, you can also read then the keys stuff which, which is on the command keys. Yeah, so this is quite nice. This is also predefined. Uh, you can customize the touch or the C layout to your needs, whatever you want. There are other, um, there are also other programs available, like Z1, which Megan program, and one which I can show directly here which looks quite familiar to you all um, because it's based on the graphics uh, of the hot PC. Um, it's called from a German colleague of mine. Um, it works exactly the same way. You go into the setup, enter the incoming and outcoming port. Um, you can switch here to, to a nano mode uh, and also to no sleep mode, which doesn't uh, dim your window then uh, or doesn't dim your iPad. Um, you can go to the playbacks. You have uh, all the playback bars uh, available, which are defined here per page. So uh, as we know, we have mind playback bars. These all can be controlled here. You've got the same, the same feedback, um, flashing lights, everything there. You've got um, the programming session exactly the same. We also have the labels uh, when you have um, picture selection done label what is on the encoders is sent. You have the labels for um, the comment keys. If I trigger them, you see here, 
these are my bump lists here. Um, you see where I'm triggering right now. Um, yeah, all the feedback is coming um, through OSC. So uh, very nice and intuitive way of programming and working with your console. Um, what is also very nice here in that app, I find, uh, is the encoder. Um, there's another option to control the encoders. It's not just like when you normally are encoders, you spin them. Uh, and here he did uh, like the control bar, the enters encoder thing. When you very nice, when especially when focusing barn doors or so like that, shutters, you just uh, have your finger on the iPad and as you see, when it lights up blue, I'm on that pad and I'm just sliding up my finger up and down. Um, this simulates like an endless encoder, which we used to know from some other consoles. Also, what is very nice is like a trigger thing here. Um, you can project it as an app, app uh, uh, by um, this way you can um, send yourself a graphic or add one from uh, from your camera or whatever. Okay. I'm taking a picture right now of myself. There we go. Use that picture. So this picture is now used here and I can give that child name here and say super Q. And I can say then, okay, I want to have like scene number 11 triggered in that case. And add that one for another one. When I close that and I have these buttons here. So this is very nice for trade fairs. Also, when you have like special looks like show start or whatever, then you know, everything runs automatically. You can easily do that uh, there. Megan has some stuff also built in like that in there. In her app uh, works exactly the same way. Um, so uh, you can find all these apps in the uh, iOS uh, store. Um, uh, from Apple. So, um, before I want to continue with the next thing, uh, I want to ask you if you have any other questions regarding OLC and MIDI, uh, OLC and iPad. Um, I don't really see any, Mark. I don't know if any is going to come in, though. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's type. Um, is there a MIDI pipe for PC to use? Um, MIDI, pipe, MIDI pipe for PC. Uh, yeah, there is one of I can't remember the name, <laughs> but MIDI? I can. Oh, I will, let me let me do it like that. I will um, when we upload that video into the study hall. I will make a, a, a PDF with a, a list of helpful links for softwares for Mac and PC. Um, so uh, that you can have all these information also available for the PC users. All right. So um, in the last bit, um, where I want a little bit of patience from you because I need to rearrange all that stuff that which was actually on my um, on my Mac and and I wanted to stream via the PC and that didn't work, so I have to switch. So now I have to change everything, which I wanted to show there on the Mac on the PC. Um, this will take a second. That's okay. I'll answer this question about GDTF. Yeah. Um, we, Hog does not support GDTF right now. It is something that's being discussed, but there's no timeline on it. Um, it's something that's being discussed. It's something that's being worked on. We just answered this question yesterday um, in the fixture building question, but there is nothing right now that we can say about GDTF and HOG. So, so if anyone else has any questions, we want to fill this time in while yeah. Mark's getting ready. We can. Um, oh, I just closed it all. But. So, 
Oh, let's see if at least this is already working. And I know Mark mentioned um, iOS apps. Unfortunately, I don't know any Android apps for you, for you guys besides Touch OSC. Um, the templates that we have online say that they work for high that they work for iPhone and iPad. That's just the device like size that we made them for. They will work with the Android phones, is what I've been told. Um, I don't know anyone who's developed a hog specific app for Android, though. I know that is something that a lot of people ask. We, I just don't have any answers. I'm almost done. I just need to find one cable and then I'm ready again. <laughs> no problem. It seems to work. So, this one uh, here. Let me take that. So, uh, here we go. So, um, when we're talking about OSC, here we go. Uh, yeah. Um, with OSC, uh, we can uh, even do even more stuff, and it's not just like the iOS or iPad app and stuff like that, or um, the app that uh, color programs. Um, what I want to show you right now, as you can already see there up there uh, with the browser window up here, is a nice little software called BitFocus Companion. It's also shareware and uh, which I think these people need to be supported. So whenever I do production with them or with their gear, I give them a little donation afterwards. Um, this little piece of software can control this nice body over here. So a lot of people uh, from you know that all, might know that already. Uh, Stream Deck uh, from Elgato. Um, this is just a that's the XL version here. They are available in three versions, one with uh, six buttons, uh, one with uh, 15 buttons, and here the large one uh, with 32 buttons. Um, so what is very nice about that software is you can um, directly control that uh, software. And this software, this companion software, has also um, presets for Hog already inside. So when you start the um, when you start the uh, the companion app. Um, ah, I forgot to show you how, what, what I'm doing because I'm not running Companion here on my computer. Um, I'm running Companion actually here on the Raspberry Pi uh, 4. Uh, that's the newest version of the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's running headless. There's a build available for that one, so you don't need any monitor or nothing at all. Just connects uh, via network. So I have only network connected here uh, and my USB to my Stream Deck. And that's it. And via my uh, computer, I log into the um, uh, br uh, via the browser. I log into the internal web server of that little uh, Raspberry here. And as you see, I, it has the IP address 172 31 31 31. And um, Inside this, you can uh, also use a lot of uh, stuff. You can trigger any kind of video devices. You can trigger the hawk. You can, um, there's a large list of uh, devices, as you see here, um, ATEM switches from Blackmagic Design, um, multi viewers, whatever, you name it. Um, here in that case, I just used, um, Re uh, Reaper um, instance, an OSC instance, a generic OSC instance, and I also use the Hot4 instance. Um, same thing, what we get is when it comes to OSC, we need to edit our settings. Uh, in that case, again, uh, my IP address, my port, um, where I'm sending the data to. Um, before, uh, you can even use multiple consoles. So if you have multiple consoles where you can want to send it, just another instance, name it here, uh, hot for number 15 or stage 12 or whatever you, you need it. And then you can have, when it comes to editing your buttons later on, you can choose which one you want to use. Um, which leads me to directly to what you can do with it. So, um, 
Here I created one page, for example, uh, for my colors. So um, let's go back here. So as you can see here, that's my color page. When I click that one, I have these uh, colors here available. And these colors are then triggering scenes on my console. And we can show that if I go to my scenes window here and I take that stream back with me. Um, and as you see, when I trigger that scene, number three is up there, and I trigger that here, you see both of them get triggered at the same. And now I trigger my scene number two and my scene number one. So this is a nice way um, when you want to have actual hardware buttons available. And the good thing about all that things together is, um, as you have seen, um, I created um, a layout which has um, pages here for colors. So I can have like um, 24 colors available. I made myself a page um, for my beams. Um, I made myself a page for positions, uh, for my effects, and so on. Um, at the moment, they are empty because that's just my um, my template file I'm using, and uh, then I lay it out in the way I need it. What I also do is I have a control uh, layout here, and in that control layout. As you see, I have a button which changes just the page then um, to that playback bar page here. And I'm gonna do that in real life and show it to you. So what we're gonna have here, I change to that control button, I go to that playback bar up here. So, and this is now my playback bar, which controls my playback bar number one. These are my flash buttons for playback bar number one. And these are the go buttons for playback bar number one pause. So we have a nice and easy way of creating an extra device um, for flashing and uh, triggering stuff. And without need to have too many hardware devices around. So that's on my command. Here I have some macros, the same thing. Um, it triggers the macro there. So just if I hit that macro, the macro 11 is triggered. You can label all this stuff. And what is also, like said, very nice, um, as you see, I made the user keys here. I have a group request running as well for uh, with Companion that we get the key labels that we can read the labels that are sent out by OLC from the hawk. Um, so we, that we can have direct feedback for kinds. We can read the kind keys here. But um, as you see, the, those play keys and those skip keys here um, are also very nice and usable um, to control directly my resolute. And let's see if that worked when we're lucky now. And because it was set up on my Mac, I'm not sure if it's working on my PC directly, but I can show it to you then how you need to set that up in Reaper to control that. So, yeah. Takes a little while because it's not evaluated on that computer because I have only bought the license on the other computer. <laughs> So to have Reaper working via uh, MIDI, you need to set up some stuff, or uh, via OSC, you need to set up some stuff, and which then leads me also then back to show you later how um, you can use timecode from Reaper. Um, so uh, you go into the settings, no audio was connected here, yeah, no. So, and here in Reaper, you find in the preferences, you find uh, control OSC web. And uh, you can use the control surface here if there's none yet done. Uh, I can remove that one. Uh, um, just add another one. You go to edit, and uh, it pops up this little window. 
Um, you go to, you can label that one, your device, for example, like Hop or Stream Deck. Uh, in my case, I want to receive only uh, my local list port is 8,000 because that's what I set up here in my uh, Reaper setup. Here in edit, I send it to this IP address and that's the uh, target port where I'm sending to. So uh, that's what I did. And it's also very nice if you sometimes don't have a monitor to listen to what uh, OSC or any OSC monitoring, you can open up a window here and you got an OSC listener also popping up. So whenever there's the uh, OSC um, command popping in, so for example here for play, or stop, uh, and this action. Um, and here is the pattern config. Um, for the most stuff you can want to use with the uh, with Reaper uh, in combination with Companion, you just go to the default um, configuration. There are also Logic Pack and Logic Touch, which are also predefined sets, uh, but you can use the default set in here. Uh, and if you're okay here, so um, when this should work now, as you see, yeah. So let's take that camera. Let's see how we can do it. Wait, I put that one here. And as you can see now, uh, I'm using the play button and Reaper starts playing. Uh, pause gives a pause. Um, this is uh, the skip, uh, the action I showed. This is the skip action to the beginning. And if I'm running the pause, I could also do an end key here on the, um, and I'm actually putting some markers and I parse that. And what I also did, I put some two buttons to skip uh, one marker back and one marker forward, which is very nice uh, when you're uh, editing a time code show. So you, you can jump between your cues and play from a specific cue. Um, companion is working on feedback at the moment in which marker you are and so on, so that you get more feedback from Reaper, so they can show you directly which marker you're actually working on at the moment. So um, this leads me then directly to um, the situation when we don't have a time code track, and I want to show you how you can easily create time code and MIDI time code with Reaper. Um, I just need to reconnect my MIDI device now, my audio device now to um, my PC. So, um, what we need for sure is uh, a media and an audio output. Um, in, uh, in Reaper, so you go again to your preferences and we have the media devices. It's my audio box USB here. Um, it's disabled. I want to enable it. Enable output. And enable so there you go. Normally, when you have that connected and you start up Reaper and you had it connected before, it works uh, directly. Um, what is very important uh, when you send want to send out. Um, the MIDI data from the um, from the devices is um, here in that window in the configure MIDI output window. Don't use that open device in low latency, low precision mode. This makes crazy stuff with Reaper when you want to when you want to send out a MIDI time code. Um, it's not working with Hot Proper or any, any other devices I tried. Um, seems like to be a bug in Reaper, maybe it's in just that um, version, but uh, whenever I have issues with that not working problem from Reaper, check that the uh, device is not into the low latency or low precision mode. That this checkbox is not checked. 
All right, so let's see one thing you need to do. Um, for audio um, device, you go up, uh, audio device, uh, audio system out, you can use Wi-Fi out, yeah, that's fine. Or uh, you can use any uh, audio driver, depending on your hardware, where you want to have it. Um, so that's all uh, depending on the uh, audio device you're using. Uh, in that case, I'm using the audio out here. Um, apply that, okay, close that. Ah. No, this audio device, sorry. There we go. No. So um, then we need a new track, uh, and this track um, could be then your audio file. You just drag and drop it inside here, and then you can play it. You have the volume down here, and so on. What is also important is um, that you root your outputs specifically. And this is this little button down here. So if you click on that button here, you see the routing for track one. And here you, design, you choose which output it should be routed. Um, and here in that case, as you wanted for an audio output, you can say, okay, we want that audio go to the left output. This could then be my uh, speaker where I'm listening to the music. And then it comes to the thing where we want to have um, our time code track um, added. And I just make a new track again. And in this, in this track, um, I insert an empty LTC MTC uh, time code generator. So it's directly in the selected track. It's done from the beginning. You can take it and make it longer from the way you need it. You can even add another one if you need a new track. If you need several different time codes, which might be one might be MTC, the other one might be LTC time code, and they might even have to have uh, different starting times. So I can also insert a new one here. Oops, doesn't do that. And it does. So and as you see, you can drag that around if you don't need it from the very beginning, or so on. Here we go. What is also important, um, so these are the, then the time code settings, uh, the generators. Uh, and now you need to define if this time code should work as an LTC, like a linear time code, that's an audio time code, or as an MTC, that's a MIDI time code. So if you right click inside here and we go to the item properties, let me see, it always opens on the wrong window. Uh, you go to the item properties, and there you find this one. Um, and here, sorry, Oh, that's a bit different in Windows than, than Mac. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. No, this window is on the Mac, it's longer, here it's wider. <laughs> so you can, you can name it. You can um, start, you can um, give um, the, the start time, where it should start. Uh, you have here, and then what is most important, you have here the properties of this. And when you enter these properties here, uh, you define here the frame rate. So for the US, mostly you we will use 30 or 29.97 per frame. In Europe, we use mostly 25 frames. You also define if you want to send an LTC time code or a MIDI time code. In my case, for example, I want now a MIDI time code. I entered the start time where it should start, maybe at one hour. There we go. So, um, and then I can close these properties. So this time code will now be my MIDI time code. And in there, it's important that I also root my MIDI time code because a lot of people forget about that. So also this track needs to be sent somewhere. And you click here, we got the routing file track two. 
and I have a new media output, hardware output, I take my um, output, audio box USB output, uh, here we go, as my output. I uh, close that, and when I go back here and I play that one, and then I can show it with the MIDI time with the MIF as a time code viewer. This is now directly running from the um, track I've been playing here. So when I stop that, it stops. So this is very, when I go back, uh, let's jump back to the to my beginning. And then show that one as a picture, picture here. And uh, I play the time code here. You see the time code is here laid back from me time code or from LT from me in that case. That was the one with one hour. And I'm also outputting from the back, as you can see here. Uh, the output goes here in the input of the before the, the LTC. Uh, here we go. Um, so I can show you these diff two different time, po time codes here in the front. So the first one is the LTC, which is that track, um, the lower track down here. Um, and the upper one is the, uh, the mean time code, make them a little bit longer. So we have to jump around, jump around. So I go back to the beginning. Install that. So we have here now our LTC time code coming out as audio. And we have here our MIDI time code coming out as MIDI. So um, also nothing really uh, new or uh, any magic behind it. It's just the way you need to how you can use it and how you can or how you need to configure um, these bits and pieces. And um, yeah, so um, this is uh, when looking at my stuff, because we also are already running out of time a little bit. Um, when, when we talk about OSC, OSC is also something which is quite often used for tracking systems or um, other control systems, because um, when we talk, for example, like tracking systems like black, black tracks or sack track or anything like that, where you can track people in 3D space, um, this stuff then is all uh, capable of sending out OSC commands. So you can then trigger queue lists uh, depending on the uh, um, location of a person or something like that. Um, for example, there was one large uh, BMW booth at the Frankfurt Motor Show some years ago, which was, was run by Hawk, and they triggered about 60 events per second via OSC because they had like up to 12 cars driving around on stage. Uh, each of these cars has a transmitter in, in it and could def uh, send data to the tracking system and show where it is on stage. And so it could be lit there on that uh, uh, walkway or street, which they actually built there. So that was one options where they could, um, where OSC was very, very widely used. Um, what I forgot to mention, which is also not very well known, we also can do what we can do with the stream deck with the companion here. Uh, a lot of that stuff can also be done directly from um, from the Hawk inside. Um, we have native control directly inbuilt for a lot of video matrices, so you can switch um, like magic stuff. You can switch AJ stuff. Um, so you only need to connect it in the same uh, network as the fixture net, uh, patch it there um, at an IP address. It works a bit in the same way like uh, media patching uh, when you um, see it for CITP layers. So you can then directly also con can control uh, video gear directly from the hawk without the need um, to have that stream deck running. What is also nice if you don't have it, Stream Deck is capable of receiving ArtNet. So you can um, define an ArtNet trigger and send just a, a value on a specific channel to trigger a button here in, um, in uh, Stream Deck. So you can have very complex setups also done uh, via ArtNet and in combination with companion with the Stream Deck. All right, have a look at my uh, little cheat sheet list. 
Um, yeah, that's basically it. So I'm open to any questions and any stuff uh, from your side. Cool. Um, I see one here for from Kevin. Do you have any thoughts? Have you used the Hog4 patch editor? And if you have any thoughts about it, the Mac app. Well, again, your, your audio was, was interrupted. I didn't hear. Uh, um, the Hog4. Have you used the Hog4 patch editor? Ah, uh, the patch editor. Sorry, yeah. Um, it was on my list, but we ran out of time. But yeah, the patch editor is also quite nice. It's a nice tool uh, where you can uh, easily edit uh, data from Vectorworks or from um, uh, WYSIWYG and stuff like that and directly create um, the, uh, a file into for the hub. Let me a second. I can. Uh, so this is also a nice tool, also done by the guys from Lumeo, those guys who also built the, um, yeah, it actually is not running on that computer, that's why I don't have it here. Um, that's a, a very nice tool where you can um, load a, a patch file, an empty file, you just define your, um, your fixtures you have. Uh, patch one of those, um, load this file into uh, this patch editor. Uh, in the patch editor, then um, take the data from the uh, Vectorworks or big file, and then you match the fixtures, and then um, all the patching information, all that stuff is done. Uh, you can create a patch file, which then which is then also an XML file, which can then directly be read by the uh, Hawk again. So very, very nice tool. Very cool to use, uh, especially when you have a lot of pictures to patch. Awesome. Um, I haven't used it, so I'm glad you have. Yeah. <laughs> Would you? So this one's coming from Paul R Rosinski. Would you use two time codes for Pro Tools time code and then one for main and the other backup? That way, in case the main fails. Um. Yeah, you can do you can do it uh, either way with two time codes so that you have like a main and backup running. Um, uh, I tend to have most of the times when I have like Pro Tools running, uh, mostly they have like a Pro Tools main and backup system. So um, I'm getting my main time code from the main Pro Tools system, the backup time code from the backup system, and uh, if it's done like that in that way, I often um, don't link the consoles uh, via uh, Hotnet. I tend to have like two separate systems in the front of house uh, when doable. And I, um, when it's that important, then I have really two separate systems which then um, are connected via streaming ACN just in the end. And the, the consoles so that they are in the same state, um, they are connected via MIDI and they get MIDI show control data. So um, the consoles are in the same playback state. Uh, each year is working on one, and the main system gets the main uh, LTC, and the backup system gets the backup LTC. Um, yeah, you can you can definitely do that also with two Pro Tools lines, um, and one via MTC and one via LTC, if you just want to have one console and just want to have a backup for, uh, for your time coding. That's also doable. So there are many ways. There's not just one way. This is always depending on on the setup and the situation you're into. So it's always backup scenarios with time code is always like very specific to the to your setup. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I, those were the only two questions that I saw that needed to be answered. Still, yeah. I mean, yeah. unless people are typing away furiously. Yeah, there are no more questions popping up, and there. Some people left already, so I think uh, yeah. we're done for today. <laughs> so sorry again for that little trouble in the beginning with the, uh, I don't know why it was not working with the PC. It was not working yesterday, but uh, Windows updates sometimes crashes stuff. And uh, you should always check on the date of the show again. You see it's again to one of the <laughs> things. Don't update your computer before the show. <laughs> Uh, always the pro tip. Yeah. 
All right, so thanks everybody for attending. And uh, for those of you who are living or understand German, uh, this, done, this one will be redone on Tuesday next week, um, 4 p.m. PM uh, for all German speakers, then hopefully without these problems in the beginning. <laughs> this was just a test run for the German one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I appreciate it. Have a good time, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.